an outgoing and vivacious mother. Everybody that met her loved her. She would make like everyday fun. She was vibrant, happy. She was the life of the party. He is savagely murdered. The level of brutality that was involved in the actual murder was just shocking. Her throat was slashed almost to the point where she was decapitated. Police hunt for an elusive killer. We had nothing else what happened. Crime scene evidence produced basically nothing. We couldn't figure out who did it and why they did it. We were really baffled. Could have been anybody. And follow a twisted trail of evidence. Why would he use a calling card? There were 44 phone calls made. Up until the day of the murder, the officer found a loaded handgun and hollow point bullets. It kind of lit up like a light bulb. Until a desperate move. This was really the one shot that the police had to solve this case. Reveal a secret that stuns everyone. I was very surprised. Like, I was shocked. All of us were. I never would have expected that it would lead to this. p.m. on a cold Tuesday in January 2003, Ramapo Police Dispatch receives an emergency call. Welcome 911. My neighbor just ran in my house and said his wife is on the floor in the house. He's here and he's sort of like in a state of shock. Let me call for you on the phone. All right, hold on. Yeah, sir, I have help on the way. If you stay right, right where you are until the officers get there, do you know if your wife is breathing? No. Why oh, she didn't answer me? Officers are dispatched to the home, located in a quiet family neighborhood. When I initially approach the house, I see a man with a young boy with this really blank face. Walking by, he didn't say anything to me. I noticed that he had a shopping bag with like a gallon of milk. I enter the home and go upstairs to the back of the bedroom to give this woman aid, only to find that I was at the scene of a murder. You know, her injuries were so severe, she's clearly dead. She's a very deep laceration to her neck, and she has what appears to be a knife handle sticking out of her chest. And the blood is just pooled around her body. To me, it looked like the blood was still moving. And I was thinking the killer's still in the house. So myself and another police officer went room by room and, and cleared the house, and we didn't find anybody else inside. At that point now, I had to secure the crime scene. I knew that it was dark, but once it's a crime scene, you try not to touch anything because you don't know what is evidence. Detectives arrive on the scene and begin their investigation in the bedroom. The victim was lying on her back, and she had a tremendously deep wound to her neck. So deep so, you could see part of her spine. There appeared to be stab wounds to her chest, and there was a large, I would call it a kitchen knife, sticking in her chest. We, of course, dusted the knife for fingerprints, which came back negative. The actual blade had gone through her and was stuck into the parquet wood floor. You know, it was a pretty brutal scene. She didn't appear to be dead for long. Her body was cold to the touch, but there was no rigor mortis. There was no lividity. We looked at a potential attack of a sexual nature. There was nothing obvious to the eye. Her clothing was not disturbed. I looked for any defensive wounds. If there was a struggle, there'd be some indication on her hands, and none of that was evident. The brutality of her injuries and how many times she had been stabbed, it looked more like the, what we would call a crime of passion. Looking around the room, investigators discover some unusual clues. I found it kind of odd that there was no lights, but the fan in the ceiling was running. The fan light had no light bulbs in it. And in the garbage basket were three light bulbs, and there was one on the floor next to it. And I'm like, you know, that just, well, what's this all about? And there was a wolf sconce that had a light bulb that was loosened. To me, it would be indicative of somebody looking to hide their presence, you know, lessen the ability of the victim to see them. The house was a little bit in disarray, but it didn't look like it had been ransacked or that it was part of a burglary. There was some expensive tools in the garage. There was quite a bit of silverware. As a burglar, they would take that, I would think. 
nothing really of value was taken, and so that started raising more questions of what exactly happened here. Police examine the exterior of the house for evidence. We didn't see any types of breaks in the windows or the screens. Everything appeared to be locked and secure. On the ground, you could see a set of footprints in the snow that led to the back door. And that door wasn't broken open, but it was open just slightly. That could have been a point of entry for whoever had done this to her. Investigators speak with the homeowner, Peter Visage. He tells police the victim is his wife, 36-year-old Evelyn Visage, and that they live in the house with their two-year-old son, Ryan. Peter told the police he'd gotten home with her and explained to him uh, what exactly happened to uh, his wife, Evelyn. It was a strange reaction. He just sort of had a very stale face. That was something that was odd to me, but it certainly didn't point any fingers at him. There was no blood and nothing in his hands or on him or on his clothes that would indicate that he had been part of the murder. While Peter is taken to headquarters to make a statement, Ryan is looked after by his grandparents. At the crime scene, investigators continue to look for any clues to who has killed Evelyn Visage. In the early stages, you don't really know the victim, and so now you have to start thinking, who would do that, and what was the reason for this brutality that was leveled against this victim? Born to a single mother in Lares, Puerto Rico in 1966, Evelyn grew up determined to escape her humble childhood. She came to this country from Puerto Rico when she was 19 to live the American dream. Evelyn landed a job at a large home improvement store in Paramus, New Jersey, where she made an immediate impression. Evelyn was a great um, employee. She had a, such a good work ethic. Everybody loved her. She was vibrant, positive. You could hear Evelyn from a mile away. She was always happy. She loved her music. She was passionate about dancing. She was a proud Latina. She was beautiful inside and out. Such a given person. She was very kind. Evelyn started dating Peter after they met at the store. Peter used to shop there with his father. He was very quiet, very polite, family oriented. He seemed like a good guy. Someone that she could see building a family with. That was her dream. Peter and Evelyn married and soon welcomed their son, Ryan, into the family. Ryan was her world. Everyone knew she had a son and everyone knew how much she loved her son. After four years of marriage, the couple's relationship deteriorated and Evelyn filed for divorce. Things started to go wrong. They were just very disconnected. But she wanted Peter to be a part of Ryan's life while they figured out their divorce and a custody agreement. But Evelyn was killed before the divorce was finalized, raising police suspicions due to the nature of her murder. The ferocity and the level of violence, you would think somebody really had an axe to grind, someone that's personally involved with the victim. You looked at the nature of the crime, it suggested that it was somebody doing this for a reason. You have a couple who are going through a divorce. In these types of cases, you're going to look at the husband. Coming up. Police discover additional suspects. We learned that he had been with hidden evidence. Evelyn had secretly audio taped some of the arguments and fights that they had been having. But just as the investigation falters, maybe he wasn't the one who actually did the murder because it just doesn't make sense. Was there a piece of the puzzle that we weren't seeing? A new face blows the case wide open. He's perspiring heavily. I can see the vein in his neck beating. And I said to him, I said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I already know what happened, and I'm going to prove it. Police investigating the murder of mother of one, Evelyn Visage, have their first suspect, her estranged husband, Peter Visage. You have to start thinking, did the husband do this, or is he involved in it somehow? Peter mentioned that his relationship with Evelyn was troubling to him because they were in a different place. He wanted her to stay home. She wanted to work. And um, the relationship deteriorated, and Evelyn had filed for divorce. Evelyn and Peter still lived in the same home, even though this divorce was proceeding. They slept in separate bedrooms, but they were living under the same roof. Peter claims he last saw Evelyn alive the morning she was killed. He had taken his son for the day. Uh, Evelyn had gone to work. Peter told us he went to his mother's house at 8.30 that morning with Ryan to do some household repairs. He 
didn't have a steady job. His parents supported him. He also did a lot of odd jobs for them that they paid him for. He stayed at his mother's house until approximately 8.30. And at that time, he went with his son, Ryan, to the Palisades Mall. Peter tells police just after 9 p.m., he called Evelyn's cell, and she told him she was at a friend's house. She told Peter that she was on her way home and would probably be home within 20 minutes or so. At approximately 10 p.m., Peter received a telephone call from Evelyn asking where he was. Peter said to Evelyn that he was picking up milk and that he would be home shortly. Peter said that upon arriving home, his intent was to put Ryan to bed, but he said that he found it odd that the lights were not working in the hallway. He said he looked into the bedroom, he saw that Evelyn was on the floor, and he said that she was obviously deceased, according to him, and he ran back downstairs and ran to the neighbor's house to call the police. Peter Visage was questioned for over 16 hours. I mean, it was a very long interview. He never asked to leave. He never said, you know, I want a lawyer, leave me alone, anything like that. He was cooperative throughout. He agreed to provide us with fingernail clippings, hair samples, blood sample, a buckle swab for his DNA. As Peter is providing samples, investigators run a background check. There was nothing in his history indicative of this violence. Parents' house. Peter visits his mother confirmed his alibi for the day and evening at the time that he said that he was there. We found Peter to be at the A&P supermarket buying milk and exiting the store consistent with the times he described, confirmed by video cameras. And he produced the receipt for the milk time and date stamped 10.15 p.m. The amount of time it took to go from A&P where he purchased the milk to his house, it just would not have been possible to commit that crime and call the police from the neighbor's phone and not be contaminated in some sort or leave behind some evidence or have evidence on him. We found no sign of any injuries. We found no sign of any blood on his person, on his shoes. At this point in the investigation, there was nothing that we could find that was showing that Peter Visage was involved in the murder of his wife. He was in all these different places where there were surveillance cameras and with a timeline that prevented him from being at the scene of the murder when it occurred. Now you have to start thinking, other than Peter Visage, who could do something like this and why would they do something like this? I asked him, what, did he have any concern about his own safety? You know, somebody came into your house, maybe they were looking for you too. Does he have any enemies? Does he owe anybody money? Does he have any uh, illegal habits, drugs, gambling? And he answered no to all those questions. And I asked him if he knew anybody that might want to do this. And he said that she did have a boyfriend and that we should look at him. And Evelyn was dating another employee of Home Depot, Mike Granda. Here you have people going through a divorce and now you have a boyfriend thrown into the mix. A motive could be jealousy, could be a fight in their relationship. The fact that she still lives with Peter could be a source of upsetment for Mike Granda. Maybe it was a jealous boyfriend who had come in there. It fit the profile for the crime scene being that it was so horrific. The next morning, Police head to Evelyn's work to interview her boyfriend, Mike, and find that her co-workers already suspect something is wrong. I remember I kept calling her because Evelyn was always at work by the time I got there, and she wasn't there that day. I saw detectives when they came in, and I got suspicious, and I said something happened to Evelyn, right? So the detective said to me, how would you know that? So what I said was, she just confirmed it to me. We interviewed Evelyn's co-workers, and to a person, they all loved her and spoke highly of her. And she had some very close relationships with people that she worked with that loved her dearly, that she was good to them, they were good to her, they looked out for each other. Evelyn was a very, very loved at work. Emotionally, it was horrible. I mean, we were her friends. We were her family. She wasn't just a friend, like, she was like a big sister to me as he to start his shift. When Mike Granda arrived for work, we told him that Evelyn had been murdered. He was visibly upset. But when detectives ask Mike where he was the night before, his answer raises his eyebrows. According to Mike Granda, he had been with Evelyn the night of the murder. At that point, you have to really look at every possibility. Maybe she was going back to her husband. Maybe she had broken up with him. Maybe it was a crime of passion. Maybe they were having a domestic argument, a dispute. We had to look at him as a possible suspect for the murder.
police hunting the killer of Evelyn Visage are focusing in on the man she was dating while in the throes of divorcing her husband. We did look at Evelyn's boyfriend, Mike Randa. There could be a source of jealousy on the fact that she still lives with her husband during this process, so he has to be looked at. Detectives bring the 28-year-old to the station for questioning. When Michael Granda was interviewed, we asked him to describe their relationship. He said initially they were just friends, but as time went on, they became romantically involved and began dating. Investigators press Mike for details on the night that Evelyn was killed. According to Mike Granda, Evelyn and he had left Home Depot at approximately 3 p.m. Evelyn had gone to the Garden State Plaza Mall to return some clothes. And she actually was supposed to be having dinner with her son that night. But Peter called Evelyn and said, I'm going to my mother's house with the baby. So Evelyn called Michael, saying that she was free. So she went from the shopping mall to Michael Grandis' house in West New York, New Jersey. Mike claims he and Evelyn had dinner. Around 9 p.m., Peter called to say he was on his way back with Ryan, after which Evelyn decided to head home to see her son. Michael Granda's house is approximately a 40-minute drive to the Visage house. Michael Granda called her when she was approximately 20 minutes from home when she was on the Garden State Parkway. Approximately 40 minutes after that phone call, Evelyn was being murdered. We asked him to describe his whereabouts. He said that he had stayed home for the rest of the night, watched TV, and went to bed. So there was a window of opportunity where he did not have an alibi that could be corroborated by someone else. We subpoenaed his phone records to try to determine where he was. Michael's cell phone records indicated that his cell phone was in his apartment or very close by his apartment in West New York, New Jersey. If he were to drive from West New York, in all likelihood, he would have to pass through a toll. We subpoenaed toll records, easy pass records. We subpoenaed some cameras, video found. So that also led us to believe that he was telling the truth. He actually was in his home at the time that Evelyn was being murdered. I never thought for one second that Mike had anything to do with it. Mike really lifted her up on a pedestal. He gave her that support that she needed. Mike made her feel beautiful. Michael was most cooperative. He offered his phone. He offered his laptop computer. He offered samples of his blood, a buckle swab for DNA, hair. He offered everything. He said, please, I know you have to look at me. Cross me off the list and find out who did this. It just never even dawned on me that the police would look at me. I just tried to give him as much information as I could. I do remember telling them, like, oh, I know you guys have to suspect me. I told them if they wanted to search my house, they could. If they wanted to search my cars, they could. I was just very focused on trying to be helpful. After the police obtained all the information from Mike and speaking with him and speaking with others, he was uh, quickly ruled out as a suspect in the murder of Evelyn Visage. And there was just nothing to suggest that Peter Visage was involved. So if you don't believe the husband's involved, you don't believe the boyfriend's involved, you have to look at other individuals that may be involved. At that point, you know, it could have been anybody. You can't make assumptions on who it could be. You have to really look at every possibility. The day after Evelyn's murder, as police consider possible suspects, news of the crime hits the airwaves. The Evelyn Vicious murder was newsworthy just because of the area. In a, a small town, we don't have that many murders that it's commonplace. This was a case that really was troubling because you have a woman who was finally brutally killed and we couldn't figure out who did it and why they did it. Hoping for a new lead, investigators look to the autopsy report to learn more about the crime. She had two stab wounds in her upper back area. Those were the initial strikes. And then she had a very deep slash wound to her throat. And then there were two stab wounds in her upper chest area, powerfully done as indicative by the fact that the knife was stuck in the floor. Based on what the medical examiner described to us, I can only imagine the sheer horror that Evelyn was experiencing. The level of brutality that was involved in the actual murder was just shocking. Her throat was slashed almost to the point where she was decapitated. It was blood curdling. She must have been scared. Somebody's in her home. She's in her bedroom. Maybe it was a burglary gone bad. And she came home and had startled whoever was in her house. We circled back to examining parolees in the area, both New York and New Jersey, sex offenders, people that have committed similar crimes, burglaries gone bad or robberies gone bad. At the time of Evelyn Visage's murder, 
There was a group of young men who were committing robberies and burglaries in the vicinity, including a Terrence Punk who lived approximately five months. Burglaries in the area, and I remember that we were having home invasions too. The name of Terrence Monk, like it, it clicked with me. There were cases, robberies, burglaries, and assaults where Terrence Monk committed violent acts on people that didn't cooperate. He was also implicated in a robbery, probably a mile and a half from the Missage House. It kind of lit up like a light bulb. He certainly went right up to the top of the list. was killed in her own bedroom in a frenzied knife attack. And now, police are investigating if a violent local burglar might be responsible. Terrence Monk was a, like a known criminal, and the detectives had been dealing with him for years at that point. We had been investigating him so arduously, and for such a long time, there was not any possibility of cooperation on his behalf. To get the information they need, investigators take a different approach. I utilized a confidential informant to try to determine where Terrence Monk was and if, in fact, he was involved in this crime. He described to me where Terrence Monk was at the time that Evelyn was murdered. He told us that Terrence Monk was in Buffalo, New York, and that was substantiated by witness statements and his cell phone records. It's another dead end for detectives. They press the informant for any other information that might help solve the case. This young man was plugged in in the criminal community so I asked him what the word on the street was. If it was a local guy chances are in the criminal community somebody would have been talking and he said there's nothing on the street at all. No information about who killed Evelyn Visage. With no other leads police re the neighborhood around the Visage home. There was multiple attempts to locate witnesses and detectives actually went back and conducted a road stop in the area, hoping that somebody may have seen something. Nothing was discovered, and we couldn't gain anything from that. In the village of Chestnut Ridge, it's prohibited to park a vehicle on the street at night. So we also checked to see if any parking tickets had been issued, or any vehicles parked on the street. There were none found. Collectively, between the police and the prosecution, we were really sitting there thinking this may never get solved. While investigators consider their next move, Evelyn's loved ones struggle to her loss. I just couldn't believe that she was killed. Evelyn was a, such a loved person by everyone. Something like that happened to her. It makes no sense. You know, there's some people that come into your life for a reason, a season, a lifetime. That's what they say. There was a lot of respect and love there. She would make that's life. I mean, you have to take every second you get because you never know when uh, it's going to end. Detectives re interview Evelyn's and colleagues hoping to uncover a tiny detail that leads them to her killer. We did speak to many of Evelyn's friends to find out if she had a lifestyle that was potentially dangerous to her or would expose her to this type of uh, demise. Her life revolved around her being a mother. She had no enemies. Everybody that met her loved her. There was not one person that met her that did not instantly take to her. She was just a really pleasant person to be around time, day and night. Well, it was very puzzling. What happened? Why was this done? With a violent killer still on the streets, concern spreads through the community. In this area, this little hamlet of Chestnut Ridge, it's just not that kind of an area where you would expect anything like this. People in the community are starting to get fearful. I remember I was living alone, and I certainly had my radar up, and I was very careful coming almost to the point of paranoia. I wasn't going to be a victim. Three days after Evelyn's murder, detectives receive explosive new information, turning the investigation on its head. Mike Granda came to the Rampo police station with some personal items of Evelyn Vistages. Amongst those personal items, we found audio tapes and a journal that she wrote in. Detectives immediately recognized the voices on the audio tapes as Evelyn and her husband, Peter. Evelyn apparently had secretly audio taped some of the arguments and fights that they had been having. Everything from any money that she spent, taking the car away from her, shutting off her phone. He wanted to be completely in control of Evelyn, 
So it was in stark contrast to what Peter described to us. The fact that Peter didn't describe any turmoil caused us to have some doubts about how truthful he was being. Evelyn's journal contains even more startling revelations about their divorce. He wanted custody. He was told that he wasn't going to get full custody. And he wanted the sale of the house. So if Evelyn is gone, he's got the child, he's got the sale of the house, and he can move on. When detectives try to follow up with Peter about these revelations, they're met with silence. At this point, Peter had retained an attorney, and we were no longer able to question him. So that again raised some suspicion. We would have to look harder at Peter based on the fact that he had the most to gain from Evelyn being dead. With Peter having an ironclad alibi, investigators consider other scenarios. Maybe he wasn't the one who actually didn't make sense that anybody else had a reason to do this. The suspicion is enough to get a warrant to search Peter's vehicle. We had no idea at the time that that search of the van was about to unleash a whole new avenue of this investigation and turn this case totally upside down. evidence in the Evelyn Visage homicide investigation has led police to revisit her husband, Peter, as a potential suspect, and they are now searching his vehicle for any trace of incriminating evidence. You just never know what might be that little piece, you know, whether it's a hair or a fingerprint or one bit of DNA might be the break in the case. Desperate for any lead in their investigation, police make a critical discovery. There was an extensive search of Peter's van that we uncovered in the back pocket of the middle seat of the van, $3,700 in cash in a white envelope. In addition to the money that was found, there was a Sprint calling card. This was tremendous, tremendous evidence that we have just now uncovered. It offered a lot of questions. Why would a person have $3,700 cash? We examined Peter's financial status. At the time, Peter was not very solvent in terms of having any money. Somebody who's, by all accounts, broke. And he's got $3,700 in the back of his hand. And of course, we couldn't ask him why, because he had already retained counsel. You have to now start wondering, why does this man have $3,700 in $100 bills left behind in his minivan? It's possible that Peter may have engaged someone to kill him. And that money was going to be used to pay off the final payment. The furthest thing from my mind was that a hitman could have been hired. That's really very rare in, in real life. Let's look at his bank accounts, his credit card statements, you know, things like that, as far as getting any solid evidence that he was involved in this. We went back and looked harder at Peter's bank accounts, stock market, anything like that, in an effort to see if he had taken any money out to try to pay somebody to maybe do this. And nothing was found to be out of the ordinary or even considered to be like a payoff. Finding no evidence Peter paid to have Evelyn killed, detectives focus on the other item found in his van. Why would he use a calling card? Most folks, unless you don't have a cell phone or don't have a landline, don't have the necessity for a calling card. If Peter had a cell phone, he had a home phone, so we subpoenaed the records for that calling card. There were 44 phone calls made from that prepaid phone card record in November of 2002 up until the day of the murder in January of 2003. 44 calls made on that card Almost all of them were detectives. But when they run it through the police database, they make a telling discovery. Police learned that Frank Thon was currently, at the time, in jail in the state of New Jersey. This is a man who's been arrested numerous times. Assaults, violent assaults. His most recent arrest was for driving while intoxicated. The officer found a loaded handgun underneath the armrest of the truck and hollow point bullets. At the time of the murder, he was on intensive supervised parole. Shortly after the Visage homicide, Frank Thon turned himself in to serve a year in the county jail. Could there be an innocent explanation why Peter called a known violent criminal for months leading up to the murder, only to stop the day Evelyn was killed? We subpoenaed Frank Thon's phone records. Analyzing his phone records, we found that he was in the vicinity of the Visage home on January 6th, the day before the murder, and on January 7th, the day of the murder. Then it became really evident to us that he was involved in this. 
So now things are starting to click. We were able to secure a search warrant to search Frank Don's apartment. And one of the things that the police recovered was a computer. Upon forensic investigation of that computer, we found that Frank Don had searched the records from his apartment to the Visage home. The evidence is compelling, but investigators need something more concrete to lay charges. Based on the evidence that we had, it still was a very weak case. We don't have any forensic evidence that would connect him to the murder of Evelyn Visage. You need the probable cause. You need the connection to prove your case and to actually have it stick. With little else to go on, detectives make a bold decision. We had no other option other than to go at Frank Thon. We knew our case would depend upon Frank Thon making a confession. This was really the one shot that the police had to, to solve this case. It was a huge gamble because if he decided to ask for a lawyer, they could not question him anymore. If he denied it, they were stuck with what he had to say. Police can only hope that Frank reveals the truth of whether Peter was involved in the murder. We don't have a case against Peter. We're getting closer to figuring out maybe what occurred, but again, it doesn't prove that Peter Visage had any relationship to this murder. We have nothing other than just the fact that Peter is calling Frank Thon. This case is going to rise and fall whether we succeed or not with an interview. Investigators head to the county jail to confront the hardened criminal. I specifically requested a small room where we could have the table against the wall, and we deliberately set that room up to increase Frank Thon's anxiety. We had lawyer boxes with Evelyn Visage's name on the boxes. We had maps with pins. Pin with everything in place, police bring in 41-year-old Frank Thon. They took the handcuffs off him, and we pretty much just stared at him for like a good minute or two, again, in an attempt to increase his anxiety. And he was visibly nervous. And I said to him, I said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I already know what happened, and I'm going to prove it. And I'm going to tell you what, a murder for hire in New York could potentially face the death penalty. We told him that we had all types of evidence implicating him, and his face hit the table. He's perspiring heavily. His heart rate was obviously increased. I could see the vein in his neck beating. And I said to him, I said, you don't have any friends in this world right now. I said, if you tell us the truth, we'll try to assist you in getting the best possible deal. There was a long pause. He took a big sigh, and then he began to tell us what happened. Four weeks after the murder of Evelyn Visage, investigators have just convinced suspected hitman Frank Thon to start talking. He almost had a look of detachment from what was going on. He took a big sigh and he said, all right, I'll tell you guys what happened. Frank Thon told us that he was the person who killed Evelyn. Frank Thon confessed not only to the murder of Evelyn Visage, but that he was hired by her husband, Peter. I really was surprised after everything was said and done, after all of the investigative leads, that it all came back to Peter. Frank tells detectives that he was introduced to Peter three months ago through a mutual acquaintance. Peter asked this gentleman if he knew of anybody that could take care of his wife. Frank Thon requested $10,000 cash with $5,000 being paid up front. We later learned that Peter obtained money from a friend of a friend on a loan a short time after that, Peter Visage met Frank Thon at a pizzeria where Peter gave Frank the down payment of $5,000 cash. I looked at the money found in the van as this could have been the final payment. To hear that for such a small amount of money that somebody was willing to go out there and kill someone, I was shocked and disgusted. In his confession, Frank describes Peter's impatience to have Evelyn killed. Peter Visage was pestering him to get this done, so he decided January 7th was going to be the night. Frank meets Peter at the Visage home the day before the murder. Tell me to lay out in the house, and I'd be able to walk to the back of the house and leave the door unlocked for me. Peter told Frank that he would uh, leave the back door open, and he establishes his alibi. He went to his mother's house, and then the shopping mall, and then stopping to get milk. He knows that there's video cameras in there. He knows that he's going to get a receipt. That's all adding time to his alibi that can also be substantiated. 
After sunset, Frank enters the Visage house and removes the light bulbs to lie in wait for Evelyn in the dark. Cross the road. He had a gun. He pushed her into the bedroom, had her kneel on the bed, and he told her he was merely here to do a robbery and he wasn't going to hurt her. He said he then took a knife that he had brought with him and stabbed her twice in the back. She dropped to her knees on the bed. I just laid down. I got one. Thawne was the instrument of Evelyn's death, but Peter Vincent brought that instrument into his own home. On Valentine's Day, 2003, a warrant was issued for the arrest of Peter Vincent. Police rushed to take Peter into custody. They said, Peter, I have very good news for you. He said, what's that? He was somewhat befuddled. I said, we found out who killed your wife. And he became like almost... Giggly. He's like, really, who? I said, you did, expletive. You're under arrest. It angers me and it pains me to think that the person that she married was the one that did that to her. It's shocking. It's sad. I was very surprised. Like, I was shocked. All of us were. He went through this elaborate murder. And I just thought, like, how pathetic are you as a person? Frank Thawne pleads guilty for his role in the murder of Evelyn. In exchange for his cooperation, he was promised a sentence of 20 years to life if he testified truthfully at the trial of Peter Visage. Peter stands trial for plotting to murder Evelyn. Evelyn's friends and family were throughout the trial present. Um, they had to endure really gut-wrenching testimony, particularly when Frank Thawne testified. He said that he told her at the end, I'm going to put you out of your misery. And your husband was the one that I hired. She was just in shock. Peter Visage never takes the stand during the eight-day trial. He showed no emotion the whole entire trial. I would look at him and then just think to myself, like, why? Why? Why you had to get to that point? Why did you do it? After hearing the evidence, the jury deliberates for only three hours. The jurors announced that they did have a unanimous verdict, guilty on each and every count, including murder in the first degree, which carried a life without parole sentence. We all screamed. We were relieved. And we felt like justice had been served. Although it was bittersweet. It's just so hard to, to comprehend why now the child doesn't have a mom or a dad. What he did to, to Ryan is just as unforgivable as what he did to Evelyn. Because he deprived Ryan of one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. I've never met anyone like Evelyn. For those closest to Evelyn, she remains alive in their hearts. Evelyn is still here with us. She's still in our spirit. She was full of love. She was full of life. She was the life of the party. She was always happy. And if you were happy next to her, she will make you happy. She was a good soul. She was a good person. She will always be missed.